All right, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see so many bright faces this morning. <laughs> I try to be bright myself. Uh, but given the weather out there and how early it is and Monday morning and all of this, I think we might find this a little tricky, right? Um, nevertheless, um, first of all, let me say I'm delighted to be here and sad that Frank Cutter, my co presenter, will not be here today. So you're going to have to put up with me for three and a half hours and nicely dispersed with a coffee break. Hopefully that won't get too boring uh, for you. Uh, but Frank says hi. Uh, unfortunately, he uh, just with his new baby and new teeth and a new position in all of this, he can make it here. But he's with us in spirit. And he's certainly very much present in all of this. And at some point, you'll see a break in style and slides. And that's where you know this is the stuff that Frank really was excited to talk to you about. Thankfully, I know this material um, about equally well as Frank does. And so for you, we should, we should not be a big difference. I think we're not seeing Frank's. Um, so with that, uh, let's uh, get underway. So the first thing um, with an audience uh, of this size that I'd like to do is, is just ask you basically a question. And that question will be, AI has recently been amazingly successful, right? And we're all starting to ride that wave, and we don't know how far we will be able to ride it, but it, it could be a long, long way. Some people out there in society start to become concerned about that. I think we here are very excited about it. What do you think is powering the success of AI? Not just this year or last year or the last five years, but overall, what do you think is the most important thing that makes really state-of-the-art AI great? Machine learning. Machine learning, that's what everybody says these days. So do we think that it's only machine learning or let me ask, no pun intended, is there maybe something deeper than machine learning? <laughs> I mean, really guys, machine learning was there in the 50s, and it didn't make the eye great then, at least not in the perception of the world. So there must be something else. Worse not, great. I was rather hoping somebody would say this, you know, we have plenty more um, computational resources so we can do a ton more computation realistically within the amount of time that we are willing to really spend to solve certain important AI problems, right? That's certainly a huge factor, and you guys can all do the math, but since the 50s, Moore's laws has given, given us factors of probably a million and more uh, in our ability to just perform computation. Great. Anything else? Is it that the way that it is, we're all here in the 50s and we just had to wait until machines were fast enough? I'd say not. And I also say we didn't just have to sit there and wait for Jeff Hinton and colleagues to come up with deep learning to make everything great. I think there's something else. In fact, I think neuroscientists believe that it's about the same thing that makes a human brain really great. And again, it's not connection or multiple games. It's heuristics. What it actually is, is modes of computation about which we might be able to sometimes prove something, but we have basically no chance and have been almost in all cases unable to prove why and when exactly they're effective. But amazingly effective in practice they are. And so I would claim all of AI is driven by heuristics, and that includes all of machine learning and most notably all of deep learning. And one of the reasons why deep learning didn't take off in the 70s when people actually were working a lot with multi-layer networks is not only that you know, we didn't have GPUs, that's certainly one factor, but the other is that they didn't quite have the right heuristics to make this fit. And so programming by optimization is very much about how to find and then exploit the power of the right heuristics. And I believe that, and we can talk about it at the end of the tutorial, that once you adopt a different perspective of what programming means, and this programming by optimization might very well point the way, everything becomes different. And it becomes different in exactly the way, same way machine learning um, makes it unnecessary for us to manually construct say a classifier, right? Of course you can manually build a classifier. Probably everybody in this room could build a pretty decent classifier completely manually for certain problems. 
But first of all, it's no fun doing that. And secondly, you're not very good at doing that, right? And that's why we have machine learning, automatic procedures that construct classifiers for us. And so what I'm going to talk about is essentially the analog of this, except not restricted to classification or regression, but for everything, right? So the idea is that we don't want to manually build a program for something, but we essentially want to automate as much as, as possible the task of making that program for solving the problem X. And if X is actually to build a new algorithm for making classifiers, that will work, right? So in that sense, even if you think machine learning is the only thing you should care about, this has a lot to say about it. It's also exploiting a lot of machine learning as we see, uh, as we go. Now the first thing I want to say about programming optimization is that it's really rooted in very early thinking. And so I want to take you back a little bit to this age, the age of machines, as I call it. It's not because that was the first time that machines were actually being used or seen as useful, but it's because during the age of uh, Charles Babbage and colleagues, that was the day and age when machines started to change everything, right? And I'm not talking about computers, I'm talking about the kind of machines we need for industrial production. But around the same time, people started feeling that machines could do a lot more than help you make stuff. And so Charles Babbage was one of these early visionaries who really wanted to automate certain modes of thinking. He wanted to automate tedious calculations. And of course, his interest in this was partly mathematical, partly military, because the calculations he was interested in were mostly the kind of calculations you have to do when you aim a gun, for example. Um, so over here, you can see actually uh, one of those uh, pieces of what would have been the first universal mechanical computer had Babbage managed to um, convince his contemporaries to fund the effort. It was believed for a long time that back then, in the 1800s, um, it couldn't have been done because mechanical capabilities weren't quite there. Nowadays, quite a few researchers who've looked deeply into this, including some colleagues in Britain, believe that this is not the case, that it would have been perfectly possible to build this machine and that it would have actually worked. Worst power of all. What's really interesting is the vision that Babbage had with this machine. He wrote, as soon as an analytical engine for this can be a universal computer exists, it will necessarily guide the future course of the science. And with that, he meant essentially all science. And then he went on to, to state, whenever any result is sought by its aid, the question will then arise, by what course of calculation can these results be arrived at by the machine in the shortest time? And that was 1864. That was essentially almost a century before the birth of complexity theory, right? Yet, the main question that was asked over and over and over again in complexity theory, what is the shortest path of calculation? What can you say about this? was already there in the <coughs> mid-19th century. And moreover, Babbage was a practical man. He was also, he was a mathematician and inventor, right? But he didn't mean, quite likely when he wrote this, provably fastest, right? But just fast in terms of practical means. He wanted to build a machine that people could use. And so there is already this intricate um, connection between computation and optimization. You see, at the very beginning of thought about computing, there was already the idea that as soon as you could mechanize computation, you would want to do it as efficiently as possible. And that that efficiency would lie not so much in the speed of the machine, but in the way we use the machine, in the algorithms. All right, nowadays, of course, algorithms control the world, everything. You know, people are in algorithms, shadow learning algorithms, other AI algorithms, and one or the other non AI algorithm as well, surely. In fact, in reality, if you really ask yourself what aspects of your life are being controlled or influenced by computers, the impact of AI is still very, very modest. So we're just at the ramp up, and this will, of course, get more, right? But most of the computation that runs your lives is of a much, much um, simpler um, and different thing. So in this article from a few years ago, um, the author states, the maths that computers use to decide stuff is infiltrating every aspect of our lives, and then uh, lists a few financial markets, social interactions, cultural preferences, artistic production, and it goes on and on and on, right? And of course, since this has been written in 2012, I believe, 
um, the development has been accelerated and it's certainly more true even now. And in all of this, um, computation speed performance tends to matter. And why is that actually? Well, firstly, um, speed matters because time is money. Quite literally, in our economy, if you can do the same thing quicker, you have an advantage, a competitive advantage, and typically that's exploitable and you'll come out on top, right? If I can make an iPhone and you can make an iPhone, but I can make it with the same cost only twice as fast, I will win. There's no question about that. And even if I can only make it 10% faster, and it's exactly the same thing, I will win too. Energy consumption, hugely important. Um, yes, there are improvements in battery technology, but it is the case um, that, in fact, something that performs the same computation with less energy is vastly preferable, especially with devices like this one here, which have a tiny, tiny battery and all the embedded systems that we're starting to see now. Um, one thing that many people don't see until they're pointed to it, and then it all of a sudden becomes very obvious, is that the easiest way to save energy, of course, is to perform less computation, right? So if you can find a solution to the same problem in half the number of CPU cycles, you've all of a sudden <coughs> saved basically a factor of two energy. It's not really like that, because in reality, there's a few wrinkles to the system <coughs> that saving computational cycles means saving energy as well. Um, and then, of course, there is the quality of results, cost, profit, weight, error rate, accuracy, all of these things, right? Um, and that's also an important way of, um, of looking at uh, performance of, of computation and something that we obviously want to optimize. And that's increasingly the case that performance matters because of globalized markets, so that just means pressure on a grander scale, just in time production and services because they rely on being able to do things fast. Um, tighter resource constraints because that means that we have to make better um, use of our resources. Um, and that in terms of resource constraints, there is an interesting little way of thinking about it that uh, should persuade you that this is becoming ever more relevant too. So here's my example. Let's think of resource allocation. We basically have something that everybody wants and then we have a certain amount of demand, right? For that. And so as, soon, as long as we have many more resources than demands, it's easy, there are many solutions and those are easy to find. So think about uh, a situation, for example, where um, you want to um, host a conference with many different tutorials and tracks and so on, and you have a convention center that like this one here is actually so big that there are many more rooms than you need for running this event, right? And so the scalability problem becomes really easy. In fact, we have so much flexibility there that you can start looking at secondary optimization criteria such as, you know, which two tutorials should be in the same slot and stuff like that. If the resources are much smaller than the demands, there is no solution that's easy to see this, right? If we wanted to run each time in a convention center that has two rooms that hold 400 people each, we can see right away that with, I think, 1,900 people coming here, it's not gonna work, right? It doesn't require much work to see this. And it doesn't require much effort to convince, you know, the people who hold the purse strings of the niche time organization that they just need to book a bigger place. The trickier thing is when the resources are about equal to the demands, right? When you have a convention center that looks like it might just be large enough or maybe just not large enough. And then it's difficult to find a solution or to show the improvability because we're so close to the boundary, right? And that is a phenomenon that has uh, been observed in practice in many AI problems, whether they deal with resource allocation or not. Um, and it's, it's widely known under the, under the word case transitions because of the typical development that's uh, closely related to that. But it doesn't stop there because when we think a little bit further, um, in this first situation where we basically have more resources than we need, that's economically wasteful if you think about it, right? In some sense, running each time in this huge convention center is not the most efficient thing that each time could have done. Um, and therefore, you might either want to you know, increase demand, run out more people, which is exactly what each time has done, um, or reduce the resources and basically say, hey, we're only going to take half the convention center and the other half to give it to somebody else, which is also, I think, what each time has done, right? Um, and so, of course, you want to do this um, as long as you can. And then, of course, in the end, you land back in this case there where, the reward, where it's just big enough what you retain, right? And where it's difficult to get. Likewise, if the resources um, are much lower than the demands, then you have um, lost market opportunities, right? So, of course, we could say, hey, you know, all we have is a convention center that holds 400 people, so let's restrict each pie to the first 400 people that want to attend. 
that will generate a lot of unhappiness playing with the community in this case, right? And, and this is not even about money here, it's just about intellectual exchange. Um, and so, of course, what you want to do is you want to increase your resources, cultivate a convention center, um, um, or if you really can, you have to reduce demand, right? For instance, by making the Japan not less attractive, by saying, well, you know, a ticket now costs uh, 3,000 Australian dollars, and all of a sudden, you know, people can just find a small convention center that short. Okay, and again, you do this, um, you know, if, if you basically want to increase resources or reduce demand, you do this until it just about fits and you're back in the difficult case. And so my argument here is problems that are easy because you have many resources, too many resources, or um, an, an overabundance of demand, these problems tend to naturally, because natural pressures come back to the hard case, where you have just about a sufficient amount of these, but it's hard to allocate them or hard to see that it doesn't quite work. So, because of this, I strongly believe that in the future, in AI and elsewhere, we'll see a lot more hard computational problems that require a lot of smartness in order to you know, use computational resources as efficiently as possible. And Moore's law is not going to help us out of this one all by itself. So, this tutorial, therefore, I want to show you a way that can help you to actually write more efficient software. And what I mean by that is not just, you know, make a blind factor of 1.1 faster. As we will see from the example I discussed, I want to show you ways in which quite conceivably and demonstrably in our work, um, there is the possibility of getting speed up factors of 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 sometimes. Uh, and if you worry about accuracy, you can very often get accuracies that are much, much better than, the thing, than what you would have possibly imagined. But also, I want to emphasize, this is not just about automating parts of the programming task. It is about automating the parts of the programming task that are boring and tedious for people, right? What I want to maintain is the parts that's human really creative, right? The part that you all enjoy about making software, planning software, building algorithms. The part that, is, that requires ingenuity. So I want to leverage human creativity. Of course, we're gonna leverage optimization and machine learning that's gonna be our main tool in order to power this approach. And of course, we're gonna basically leverage Moore's law, you know, the large amount of computation we have available these days in large amounts of data as well. Okay, so here's the key idea. And if you don't like this key idea, you can sit through the rest of the three hour tutorial and try to be persuaded of its value, or you can leave and say, hey, I've read, I, know, I now know what program of optimization is about and don't think it's so cool, and I'm not offended by that. So the key idea is to no longer think of programs, and I remind you that a program is something that you can literally take and run on a machine, right? It might require inputs, but it doesn't require human intervention to run on a machine, otherwise it's not really an algorithm, right? It's not really a program. Um, we go from this to a potentially very large space of programs. And how do we do that? Well, we encourage software developers, and ourselves are included, to avoid premature commitment to design choices. So you all know these moments when you basically develop an algorithm, and let's say you're developing an AI system that has a machine learning component, just to keep this really nice and grounded. And so it's a classification task that you have to solve as a subtask within your great AI system, right? Let's say you want to build an autonomous flying system or something. Um, and so the question is what classifier should you use, right? How do you decide this? Any ideas? Nobody ever built a super system with a very cool name? Nobody really. That's you take whatever software you get. Huh? You take whatever software you get. Yeah, right. You take the first thing you find free on the web and you run it and you know your system does great. And, and that surprisingly often that actually works, right? And sometimes it doesn't. And so let's just say you take the first thing that's free and it works so so. So you're not quite happy, what do you do then? You look for the next thing that's going to try it, right? That can be a pretty tedious process, actually. And so, in reality, what we really want to do is we want to keep this open. And, and ideally, you know, if we were in the, what is it, 20, I don't know the start time so well, but you know, in the day and age of Captain Kirk and beyond, we would want to say, come here, find me a good classifier. And it would do that, right? That would be much nicer than you having to hunt down the free stuff and then trying it and doing hyperparameter optimization on it and all this stuff. 
Um, and so what I mean by avoiding premature commitment is to avoid exactly doing what Alan Keely Keely um, suggested, right? Taking something that makes sense at the time for whatever reason, plugging it in and then forgetting about it. That's premature commitment because you have no way of knowing whether that was the right thing to use. Moreover, perhaps you want to seek and maintain design alternatives very proactively, right? Maybe you want to proactively go out there and say, I'm not really going to be ever satisfied with just one classifier. I'm going to have a whole bunch of classifiers here. And then depending on where I use my automatic piloting system, whether it's in a Cessna 172 or an Airbus A380, right? Um, I'm going to automatically pick the one that's better. And that's exactly the key your way. It's because the key is once you have this flexibility, these choices that you have left deliberately open, then you automatically find instantiations of the choices, right? Designs that you get by instantiating them all um, that optimize performance for a given use context, right? And that's in a nutshell program about IBT. So now, of course, the rest of the time, I have to talk to you about, you know, especially how you do this last bit to automatically find performance optimizing designs. Because if we can't do that, then the entire thing is a nice idea, but, you know, no more than that. If I can convince you that this can be done, then we have something potentially very powerful. So here's the idea graphically once again. You have three different application contexts. Let's say you want to fly your Cessna 172 and the Airbus A380, and something in between, like you know, a Boeing 737, uh, right? Um, and you want an automatic flying system for all three of them. You could essentially take uh, your system, make it so that it works for all aircraft types, and then sell it you know, to Cessna, to Airbus, and to Boeing, and they will deploy it, and hopefully they will be somewhat happy, right? But that's likely not the best thing to do. Likely what you would want, what would be much better to do is to take um, a system that is, has design choices open, right, symbolized up there in yellow, um, and then instead instantiate it to get a specific system for each of these situations. And it's not hard to see that you should expect from this process, you get something much better for each of the three use contexts, right? All right, so here's how it's going to work for the rest of today. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, motivation and introduction. Um, then we'll, I will talk about um, algorithm configuration, which is sort of the key um, task that you have to be able to solve in order to make programming or optimization work for you. Um, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on that because it is so important and so exciting as well. Um, during that, we're going to have the coffee break. Um, and by the way, I don't see a um, clock in here, so every once in a while I will check here. But if you see that I'm running badly into the coffee break, by all means, you know, just start waving it, because I think we all need that technique. Uh, and that's great. Um, afterwards, I will talk about portfolio based algorithm selection. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Of course, I'll explain it in detail. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about software development support um, for a future direction which sort of paints you a picture of where I think PBO can go in the future uh, when it really starts revolutionizing the way we build all sorts of systems, not just the bad systems. All right, so I want to start by telling you a story. And <coughs> this is the first time I'm going to tell the story with other than me um, having a particular person in the audience that witnessed that story as well. So actually, if I were a really a real game show host, then I would now invite Alan Coombs back here, my colleague from the UC, to come up here and tell the story himself, because he was there and experienced it all. But uh, instead, um, I will tell you the story and invite Alan to correct me if he feels that anything has been misrepresented. So this is the story of how PBO essentially came about, how we had a realization in a really nice joint research project that then led me to, to feel that you know there is something that really goes much beyond what happened in this particular product. And what happened in that project was already really cool, let me tell you. Um, so Alan is into formal methods, into verification, and I'm very much into SAP solving as an application, right? And so these two things go very well together because SAP solvers have played a major role over the last, I think Alan can say 15 years or so, uh, in um, making Follow verification systems that actually work very well in many domains. Not everywhere, but in many domains. And so we had a goal, which was let's do software verification, let's do it SAP based, that seems like a pretty reasonable thing. 
And the idea was that we wanted to solve SAP and call the software verification problems, of course, as efficiently as possible, right? If you do anything SAP based in the back of your mind, it's always a SAP competition, which is the world championship of SAP solving. And if you can win medals there, then you know, job offers coming for your students, you get tenure, all sorts of wonderful things happen, right? So, so this is the thing. It's a very competitive field satisfiability, and this crept right into this pro into this uh, project here, which is good because, as we've heard earlier, um, already you know 150 years ago, some of the uh, fathers of our field have, have been thinking about making things efficient. So why not us? And so, Alan at the time had a student called Dom Roy Balich, who had just started um, working with Alan on various things um, related to um, formal verification. Domeroy at that point, um, I think had very little experience with SAP solving, right? I think uh, I met him at the SAP conference where he was just soaking up eagerly everything he could about SAP solving. And so he had this really great approach where he said, you know, I want to learn about as many SAP solvers as I can. Actually, I've seen his approach um, about 20 years later in Donald Kuhn, when he wrote a part of his book on, on uh, the art of computer programming. Um, and, and immerse himself into SAP. He had exactly the same attitude. Let's learn all we can about all sorts of different SAP solvers and then see what they can do. And Domino's way of seeing what they can do is to implement a very, very flexible solver that embodies all of these little heuristics and tricks and techniques. And that solver was called Sphere. And you can see Sphere as a highly, highly parameterized algorithm, right? And so Domino then went, all right, uh, now I have all of these techniques in here, how do I use them? And he started experimenting manually. At which point he met one of my PhD students, Frank, who isn't here today. Um, and the two started chatting. UBC Computer Star and the Science Department is a great place where students can hang out and chat and share their research and so on. So that happens very frequently. But here's something much more interesting came of it in that essentially Frank told Donna Boy, oh yeah, this problem of having a solver with many parameters and not knowing how to set them. I've had that before, and I wrote a little script that can solve that. Now, it wasn't just a little script, it was actually a little research project that Frank and I and Thomas Schütze at uh, ULB had done together. Um, but, you know, it started essentially like, like that, a little script that could fiddle with the problems. And Don Maguire said, well, you know, that sounds really interesting, but I think I've finally fiddled enough with this thing, and I don't think that you could do any better. And Frank was like, oh, I'm a competitive fight, so let's, let's just see, right? let's put this to the test. And so the two agreed to work together, and Alan and I were kind of friends before, so we were delighted that our students wanted us to work together, so we all started working on this. And I should point out that this sphere solver, um, after a few iterations of the process that I wanted to describe to you, ended up having 26 parameters, which um, corresponds to something just shy of 10 to the 18 computation. So that's a lot of space, parameter space to search through, right? So Domino I configured manually, and because he too was competitive and wanted to really see how far he could push it, I think he put a little bit of extra time in when Frank started getting ready for the automatic experiments um, to get the best thing he possibly could. We used ParMile S, that algorithm configuration procedure we had developed just a few months earlier, and here's what he got. MiniSAT 2.0 was sort of the main champion for application type uh, SAP instances at the time. Um, it solved 302 out of a set of 302 um, verification in benchmark instances in an average of 161.3 CPU seconds, right? And that's sort of the world champion SAT solver, uh, very good baseline for our work. The original version of Sphere, um, configured by Domagoy, solved 298 of these instances, so almost all of them, in 787.1 CPU seconds. So you would say, mm, that's not so good, right? Oh my gosh, should have never spend all this effort, but quite on the contrary, I think it's absolutely remarkable for a new PhD student with very little background in SAT solving to get that relatively close to the state of the art. That's really cool, because the mini SAT team have been at it for years and years and years. Um, so this is sort of somebody who says, today I want to be a triathlete, and then competes next year with the world's best triathletes at 100, you know, second or third. It's about that good. Now we optimize here, of course, not on these 302 instances, but on um, basically another training set of similar instances. And look what happened. We got down to 36 seconds and we solved all the instances. So here's where Domador's decision to include all these heuristics, right, and make them all accessible as parameters um, had already paid off. 
And then we have this idea that, well, you know, this is just a generic set of training instances. Why don't we train that just for software verification? And we had some concerns about that, um, thinking, well, you know, maybe it overfits. Um, who knows what's going to get out of there? But we tried it, and it didn't overfit, and it got the, the solving time down to 1.5 seconds. Right? So this is now the equivalent of, you know, you, you're just this brand new tire fleet, but you sort of put yourself on some super booster stuff. And on these certain types of venues, you can now outperform the Olympic champion by, in this case, a factor of, uh, well, uh, 1.5, you know, over 100, right? Moreover, we are now 500 times faster than the manually optimized uh, version that don't have one And that was, in, uh, that was independently confirmed as the new state of the art for these kind of problems in the 2007 SMP competition as well. So it wasn't just us who found that. So this is a great story about how fiddly automatically with parameters gets you great success, right? And we were all very happy about it. But in reality, and it took me a few years until I realized the full impact and meaning of this, in reality, something much more fundamental has happened here, which so far in the story didn't even come out. And it's like this. When Domino at first saw, and in fact, the solver at that point had, didn't have 26 parameters any longer, it had much fewer. But when Domino at first saw that Paramount S could sort of get close and then very quickly better than his manual efforts, he went like, whoa, why don't I go back and open up the design space, look at some of these choices which I could never make to work. This very good selection you were seeing here, I could never get it to work. But this thing perhaps seems to be pure magic. Maybe if I give it that choice too, it will be better. And so we gradually opened up the design space and ended up being implemented even more heuristics because we felt empowered that the automatic optimization process would be able to exploit it when it did. And that, in reality, is the much more relevant part of the story than we got a 500-fold speed up. And you can see why, right? Because the 500-fold speed up changed an outcome. But Domino is feeling, I want to go differently about constructing the solver. That changed the paradigm. It changed Domino's thinking about how to make a good solver. And we were very lucky in that Domagoy, he was first out loud for that because he had already started with an attitude that was that let's just let's not just pick the first free solver that I come across, but let's look at everything, right? So that was great because he had the right mindset in the beginning. He just lacked the bit that said, by automatically making all the choices that I really can't make that well, we can extract the full power of what's what's really here. Okay. So that's the story. So now let me very briefly talk about levels of programming optimization, just to make it clear that you can think um, very narrowly about that and also extremely ambitiously about it. And that all depends on how adventurous you are and how bought in you are already and you know, how excitable you are essentially. So let's start at level zero, which I want to, um, to see analogously to maybe a hot air balloon, right? It's something that gets you off the ground quite gently if you handle it well. Um, the ones that people write it, they don't go very high and they certainly don't go fast at all. And this is sort of um, the equivalent to optimizing the settings of parameters exposed by existing software. I'm sure you guys have all worked with software, whether it was written by you or by others, that has so-called performance parameters, parameters that don't change the semantics of what happens, but only the efficiency or the quality of the outcome. And you can fiddle with these parameters. And that's what PEO and level zero looks like, right? Level one is a little bit more ambitious, sort of like a little single engine plane gets you higher and faster than a hot air balloon. And what you do is you expose design choices that are hardwired into existing code, right? So that's what Domagoy did after he saw that at level zero, things were working really well. And so typically you look then for magic constants, hidden parameters, hidden parameters being things that you know, are variable in your program but are not exposed to the command line, for example, or the UI. Um, and abandoned design alternatives. And all of these things happen actually in the voice uh, work on Sphere. If you are even more ambitious about this, like we are after we've seen how well this can work, um, this can take you sort of into the supersonic realm, right? You get jet engines and you might be able to break through basically the, the sound barrier. And, and 
in the PDO world, this means you keep and expose design choices considered during software development. So you kind of say, I could make this work manually, but I don't have to because there's better ways of automatically getting to work for me. Um, and once you start doing that, um, you find that you get quite a few more design choices, right? Now, if you think carefully back um, of your own AI software construction efforts, I think many of you will go, hmm, yeah, I probably I probably abandoned a few design choices. You know, I tried this and it didn't quite work. Not because it was semantically wrong, but just because it didn't get the performance, so I switched to something else. Then I never went back to the first thing. That's exactly what we want to avoid here at level two, right? Where we just keep these design choices. Now, if we want to be taken to the moon or just beyond, you know, the gravitational field of our planet, so to speak, then we have to be more proactive. We have to strive to provide design choices and alternatives. So that's one level further where you say, I'm not just taking all the things that I thought of anyway, but now that I know this works, I'm gonna proactively start thinking, you know, what other heuristics would work here? What other classifiers might I be able to use here? What other precondition conditions might I be able to plug in here? So that's PBO level three. And then finally at level four, you will sort of try and go warp drive, right? We, we don't know whether warp drive can ever exist. Some of us believe maybe, some of us believe maybe not. But it's a nice thing to be speculating about, and work drive for PDO means essentially a proscriptive uh, kind of commandment that says, do not make design choices prematurely that cannot be justified compellingly, okay? And of course, we kind of know that there are situations where we still have to make these choices just because of limited resources and so on, but we know then that it's something we rather would not want to do. We're kind of breaking a rule and we feel a little bad about it, and that's what PDO is ever for looks like, right? Where for all the important design choices you ask yourself, is this really what I want to commit to? Are there good reasons? And a good reason would be A, a theorem, or B, running out of resources, right? There are no other good reasons in my opinion. All right, so here it is in a picture um, what uh, this is all about. So here we have an algorithm. Actually, let me get this other pointer here, which hopefully has a working laser pointer that can be seen. Yeah. So here is an algorithm. Here we have a performance gauge hooked up to it that tells us how well it works. And other than this, we know nothing about the algorithm. We can only observe how well it works. We can feed in um, inputs, and we can observe outputs, and we can observe performance, and that's it. Otherwise, it's a completely black box. And so the idea now is that uh, we have parameters. And some of these parameters might actually be continuous settings. Some of them might be categorical, or just only a flag, on, off, A, B, C, that kind of thing, right? And so we know that by fiddling with these, we can impact performance. And then the idea behind PDO is, if that's the case, then, well, we want more parameters, right? Because if we fiddle with more parameters, we should get even higher performance. Make sense? Very good. Notice how much this is analogous conceptually to machine learning, right? Machine learning means I could build a classifier by hand, and people have done this many years ago, right? Um, but I think the machine can build a better classifier for me based on data, right? Plus, I don't have the effort of having to fiddle with all the parameters of the model, right? And so in machine learning, then we say, well, you know, we want an automatic parameter fiddler, right? Which is just the learning algorithm itself. In machine learning, of course, we say if we have too many parameters, then the model could easily overfit. That's going to be a bit of a concern here as well, but much less so for reasons that I will explain later. So just in a nutshell, this is amazingly successful. Um, SAP-based software verification that I talked to you about, uh, speed ups up to 500. Um, even on instances that were very easy, we still got, or instance sets, I should say, uh, we got speed ups of 4.5, right? These were instance sets where people basically thought, well, they, they kind of topped out, right? You can't do very much at all. So even there we got something. And that happened at PDO level two and three. AI planning, actually a few rooms over, um, there is uh, my colleague Mauro Vallati who's talking, he was part of this work here. Um, we took uh, one a state-of-the-art AI planning system, um, pdo defined it, um, we did that only at PDO level three. 62 parameters and got speed ups depending on the planning domain between three and 118. And you know that in order to win the planning competition, another one of these AI world championships, right, or I could say an Olympic discipline of AI, um, it doesn't take typically a factor of three, right? So this is, this is pretty significant. 
Um, and then finally, mixed integer programming for those of you more into sort of industrial optimization applications. Um, you might have heard of CPLEX, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. It's a commercial piece of software. We treat it really just as a black box, so we can't look inside, we can't expose new stuff. Um, and there are uh, 76 parameters, and we got speed as between 2 and 52, and it worked that we've done on that contract, so I can't really talk about the slide. We've got um, speed ups of more than 10,000. Okay, and then of course you can do the same for optimizing solution quality. We've done timetabling work at UBC. For a while, UBC was actually using our timetable to schedule all exams university wide. Then they decided that we weren't a professional enough entity um, and that they needed an outside vendor. And literally, the woman who uh, previously manually scheduled the exams, she said she cried the day that they forbade her to use our software because you know they had a millions of dollar expensive solution that worked a lot worse. So it was really like, here, of course, to go back to the small ages. Even at good universities like UBC, sometimes these sort of things happen, right? Um, but in the uh, in the meanwhile, quite a few generations of students were happy with their exam time tables. That was PBO level two to three. And then more recently, um, we worked on machine learning, uh, notably classification, where we did hyperparameter optimization and algorithm selection, um, and actually uh, got uh, something that outperforms specialized model selection hyperparameter optimization. Uh, quite significantly, and I'll talk more about that later. So, um, PDO in a nutshell enables performance optimization for different use contexts, and I will talk quite a bit more about that later. Um, adaptation to changing use contexts, so I will not talk about this here, but you, you can easily imagine, right? If you can optimize for a use context, but the use context gradually changes underneath you, right? Then, of course, you can just run this PDO optimization process um, in parallel, and you will get something that tracks those changes, hopefully. So, uh, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has really done much research on this, but there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't work just marvelously. Sub adaptation while solving given problem instances, there is some work uh, along those lines by other groups. Um, and automatic generation of instance based solver selectors uh, that's a mouthful. The idea is essentially that um, if you don't think that you can make one algorithm that's good for all the different kind of instances that you might want to solve, what you really uh, do then is you make an algorithm selector that looks at the instance to be solved and makes a decision on the fly what to use on it. And you can combine that very nicely with, um, with PDO. In fact, it is a type of PDO already, and there's a lot of work on this, and I will talk about it. And finally, automatic generation of parallel solver portfolios. If you're saying, well, you know, let's not commit to one solver, but let's run a whole bunch of solvers in parallel and then, you know, take the results given by the fastest or the best or integrate them all together. Um, that's what this is about. about. Um, very powerful idea, prominent in AI. Uh, and as I will explain to you, PDO can support this beautifully well. So before going into um, the details, how this all can work, um, I want to talk a little bit about cost and concerns at, at a high level. So because you might at this point sort of have some reservations. And I want to address them head on. So, what about computational complexity, right? So, we're talking about um, design spaces with 700 parameters. Doing search in a 700 dimensional space, as we all know, is pretty hard. Um, of course, these days we are all a little bit jaded by the machine learners who say, yeah, yeah, we can do search in billion parameter spaces and so on. But uh, when you talk to them in more detail, especially the deep learning people, and you start realizing that they make no claims that they find even local optimal in those spaces, right? And that it's not clear that what they're doing doesn't hopelessly overfit their very nice big of glass and then throw some doubt on this. So, you know, it, this is complex. And then most learning problems um, actually commit you to models that are in some sense numerically easy to fit. I mean, when I say in some sense, what I really mean is from a computational complexity point of view, right? And so once you go beyond these nice sort of regular learning problems, things become uh, nasty in a hurry. You might be worried about cost of development because there is you know, more code to maintain uh, with all these alternatives and design choices. And you might be worried about limitations of scope. So I want to briefly talk about all of these, just very briefly. So is it computationally too extensive? Well, let's revisit Spear. The total time that, we, that it took us to perform these configuration uh, experiments uh, to basically customize steer for these verification problems was 20 CPU days, just in about. <clears throat> that sounds like a lot, but if you have a little cluster, it's not so bad. Um, in a 10 CPU cluster, you, you have this done in two days, right? And that's exactly what you get. 
And so here, the, the cost of the Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, just as one sort of commodity vendor, um, would be 60 Australian dollars and 22 as of yesterday evening when I looked it up. That's 48 US dollars. Right? So this is pretty cheap, actually, right? You can't buy that much. Um, I think uh, here you might be able to buy yourself a dinner for 60 Australian dollars, and then it's gone. Um, moreover, um, in Australia, um, you can pay about one hour and 42 minutes of typical software engineer time for that money. Um, and that's because Australia has actually a pretty low minimum, uh, pretty high minimum wage. Um, just to put it into perspective, in the United States, where Amazon um, uh, is based, uh, that would be about twice as much, right? Because the minimum uh, wage is that much lower. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, I was splitting ahead of myself. So, the typical software engineer is actually not that different. In the United States, it would be one hour and thirty. Uh, it would be one hour and thirty. The minimum wage is three hours and thirty-three. If you believe that somebody at minimum wage could do anything meaningfully with uh, parameter optimization or uh, algorithm configuration, and that in the states is is higher. That's uh, that's six hours and something actually. Okay, so you know I would challenge everyone who says this is too expensive to just look at these numbers and then think about. I mean, of course, the way we really do it is we have our grad students uh, fiddle with it, right? And grad students are actually typically at yeah. Not as expensive as a typical software engineer, but not at minimum wage, one would hope, right? And, and so realistically, um, if you really think that a grad student within three or six or even 10 hours can, can get results as good, then you just about break even, but in reality, um, they don't, not because they're not smart, but because humans are just not very good at these tasks. So is it too expensive in terms of development? Um, not clear, design and coding, of course, there's a trade-off between performance and flexibility and overhead, but you control this trade-off, right? So, of course, we know what your development budget is, and so that's one of these things that I said earlier, even as never before, if you only have that many hours to put into it, then you better focus your efforts on the most promising alternatives, and that's where your own intuition comes in. Um, the overhead depends on the level of PDO. Low levels of PDO require almost no overhead. Higher levels require more, but can also get you um, more results, so, so more impressive results, more leverage. Um, and finally, I want to point out that the, uh, that the provisional approach um, actually also has cost, and that is the cost from the manual exploration of the design space. And you know, I've never done a formal study, I probably should, but I suspect that the cost for manually exploring design choice in almost all the cases is about as large as doing PDO at level two. Okay, certainly at level one. Good, and then there is, of course, if you have a concern about testing and debugging because you know there's now many different paths um, in this configuration space, uh, many different ways the program can operate as a result of that, um, that all have to be correct, right? And so you might say that's a lot of testing and debugging in addition to just one program that's fully committed to all design choices. And you're right when you say this. But thankfully, the design alternatives for individual mechanisms and components can be tested separately. So that actually keeps the testing effort from um, exploding combinatorially. Um, and moreover, and that gives you a, a linear effort rather than exponential in the number of design choices. Um, and moreover, um, I think if we seriously commit to this PDO paradigm, there are ways of automating debugging that currently just aren't um, as effective, but that will become super effective there. Things like Delta debugging, fuzzing, and so on. Good. <clears throat> now, finally, um, when we first wrote a paper, a paper on PDO and submitted it, people said, well, you know, this is very nice, but it's really limited to um, solving NK hard problems, so maybe of limited interest. And my first response was to laugh out loud, but like, whoa, limited to NK hard problems, right? How bad can it really be? And now here we are all AI researchers, so we go like, give me anything that works well for NK hard problems, I'm happy, right? But in reality, not even this is true, right? It's true that for NK hard problems, heuristics are much more important than for other types of problems, computationally easier problems because heuristics are essentially the only way to get leverage on NP hard problems, right? Um, but, in fact, there's PDO-flavored work in the literature on a lot of polynomial time problems, such as computing platform-specific performance optimization of linear algebra machines. And you know that linear algebra is underlying everything, you know, like learning, graphics, wherever you go, physical simulation. Um, <clears throat> so as early as 2001, of course, I didn't call it PDO, 
um, Whaley, Clint Whaley realized that uh, it would be good to actually automatically adapt these routines, these very simple linear algebra routines to the platform in which you execute and showed that big speed has been obtained that way. And he did it automatically, albeit a bit naively. Um, optimization of sorting algorithms using genetic algorithms has been done uh, about 10 years ago with great success by people at Microsoft Research and elsewhere. Compiler optimization is a big one. Actually, one of my students, Chris Fawcett, and I are currently working on it, but there's a long line of work that goes back that shows rather than just specifying O3 if you use something like GCC, it's much better if you can uh, optimize the compiler settings for your actual population targets. You can get very significant speed ups that way as well. Of course, these are not speed ups of a factor of you know, 10 or 20, but you can easily get 50% or sometimes even a factor of two out of it. And then database server configuration has been shown by Dow et al. in 2003. Um, it can actually be done uh, using this kind of philosophy as well. All right, so hopefully by now you are convinced that programming and optimization is worth looking at. If not, of course, feel free to leave that into the appendix. Um, if you stay, I'm going to tell you next about algorithm configuration, which is sort of the key problem you have to solve in order to do PDO, because that's what you need to do when you have a highly parametric piece of code, as PDO gives you, right, and you want to optimize it for a specific use context. So this is where Frank's slides come. I like to use Latte. Frank is a big PowerPoint user. And so let me see. I have not used PowerPoint for many, many years. But perhaps if I'm very lucky, I still can. So far, it seems to work. So here's a little overview. Um, we're now at the second uh, part, and so I will talk about configuration methods, which are basically the components of algorithm configuration procedures, right? So the, the building blocks. I will then talk about systems, um, complete algorithm configurators that use these components effectively and can be used for PDO. Um, I will give you a planned demo because I'm too scared to give you a live demo, knowing that this always takes a lot of time. And I will talk about some practical issues. Around that time, we'll have coffee, maybe a little early, and maybe after systems, we'll see how it goes. And then I'll talk about a few case studies before we go into the other part of the tutorial. Okay? So, algorithm configuration in a nutshell is the optimization of free algorithm parameters. And let me say one more time in reality, if you think back to your undergrad days, as long as these parameters are free, it's not even an algorithm, right? Because you can't executed unambiguously on the machine. It only becomes an algorithm once all the three parameters have been instantiated. <clears throat> and so the question here is which parameters, and the answer to this is the ones you would otherwise tune manually, and maybe some additional ones. But the key thing is we look at all the parameters that impact performance, but not graphic semantics. Okay. So there are examples of free parameters in all through AI, right? You can all think of examples of free parameters um, in tree search, in particular for satisfiability and constraint satisfaction, in problems like this, there is pre-processing strategies, branching heuristics, cross learning and deletion and this, um, mechanisms, restarting strategies, data structures, and so on and so forth, right? Um, in local search, if you do local search for anything, like planning, for example, there are neighborhoods, perturbations, you use the new search, the, the do list lengths, right? Um, and meaning schedules, and so on and so forth. If you like genetic algorithms, I think in this room probably not too many, although we should always be careful. You know, there is this other AI community, the engineers, you know that? We tend to go like, oh yeah, the engineers, right? Let me tell you one thing about the engineers. Um, and and I'm, I'm thoroughly part of this community as well. The engineers are at least 50% responsible for the current human AI, because they're the guys who actually build a system based on deep learning that makes the subway run. And that's when a company says, I want to invest in all million dollars into AI. And the guys who build genetic algorithms, I know some of them very, very well. They're super successful with industry. They actually go to the likes of Porsche and Audi and other you know, um, automotive um, manufacturers and make them use AI methods, where some of us have tried and failed. So we should not look down on them. Um, so genetic algorithms, you have population size, mating scheme, crossover operators, mutation rates, and so on and so forth, right? Now, much more to the flavor of this audience, machine learning. 
you would think, yeah, machine learning solves all of this automatically. If, you, if I use machine learning, I don't have three parameters. No, 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 right? Because we only do have a parameter optimization. And basically, doing cross valve is not going to do a good job of it, I can tell you. Um, so, you have pre processing techniques, regularization, which type and strength, mini batch sizes, if you do mini batch learning, learning rate schedules, which optimizer to use, the optimizer parameters, and so on, right? And in deep learning, in addition, you have the number of layers, layer types, the number of units, dropout constants, weight initialization, and deep nonlinearities. Do you know that Google has started a new group called Auto ML not long ago? You know what Auto ML is? I'll tell you, Auto ML is EEO for machine learning. That's all that is essentially, right? So they hired, I think, to the tune of 100 people to do EEO for deep learning because they think it's going to get them to the next level. And I think they're absolutely right about this because. All of these parameters need to be determined. All these design choices need to be made. And it's foolish to think that people can make those decisions better than machines. OK. So the first thing to notice is that there's different types of parameters, right? There is continuous or integer or orthogonal parameters, right? These are all numerical. There are categorical parameters. These have finite domains. They are unordered, right? So for instance, if at some point I can plug in a heuristic, right? And I have three kinds of heuristics, A, B, and C. I can use one categorical parameter with three values to control that design choice, right? A, B, C. And A isn't really smaller than B or C, right? It's just I call them A, B, C because I need to use some sort of symbols that happen to have a total order on them. But for the parameters, that total order doesn't matter. It's unordered. So the parameter space has structure. For example, a parameter C may only be active for a certain heuristic, right? I talked earlier about tab research, which is a specific type of local search, quite powerful actually, and it has its own parameters. Once you say, I want to use tab research for this, you have more design choices within it. But these design choices obviously only matter if you do use tab research, right? And the same holds for all sorts of other higher level choices. And what we say is that um, C is a conditional parameter with parent H if. Um, this H needs to be set to a certain value in order for C to even become a meaningful parameter. Does that make sense? So it's sort of a sub parameter, okay? And then these parameters actually give rise to a structured space of algorithms, right? You get an algorithm <coughs> by instantiating all of them. Um, and you get many configurations. Um, in many cases, you have uh, high powers of 10, like 10 to the 47, 10 to the 17. We've seen 10 to the 100 and something, right? These are numbers that are so high that you typically only encounter them in astronomy. You know, people talk about the number of stars or particle physics when people talk about the number of elementary particles in, in a certain volume uh, or a mass of uh, material. Uh, so, but, but it's similar here. The configurations often yield qualitatively rather different behavior, right? So it's not like the behavior only changes gradually. That's sometimes the case, but often you get radical changes, even as a numerical problem that crosses some threshold that you didn't even know about. Um, and that happens in so-called fixed position phenomenon. And so therefore, um, we need to do algorithm configuration as opposed to just parameter tuning. Parameter tuning to me always suggests that you're already quite good and you fill in a little bit, you find adjustments, right? It's like tuning a car. You don't most of us don't think about tuning a car by ripping out the engine, ripping out the transmission, ripping out the suspension, and then rebuilding it, right? Um, that's building a car. That's configuring a car for us, right? But it's not tuning a car. And this is really a configuration class. It's not like I take these algorithms and fiddle a little bit with the parameters. No. I don't have any values for the parameters. I want to find through that instantiations for them, right? Different. It's not tuning. Um, very good. So here's the algorithm configuration process. What you have is a um, configurator. That's a piece of software that actually takes in parameter domains and starting values. That's just a specification written in some file. Um, and it takes a target algorithm and then does calls to that target algorithm in here with different parameter values, right? And so the target algorithm then within its configuration scenario solves problem instances. These instances are specific to the configuration scenario, right? So they are the kind of instances that you want to solve. You can think of them as training instances for this process that, this, that we are running here. And then we obtain a performance measurement here called solution cost, right? The configurator observes this and decides what parameter settings to test next. And so then it works in a loop like this. It's an iterative process. 
Okay, does that make sense? You don't have optimization policies. Um, so the important thing is these problem instances can change, and I get a different configuration scenario. The target algorithm can change. The configurator is a fairly um, you know, generic piece of software. Of course, we can change it, right? But ideally, you just want to have one and use it. Now, if you think a little bit further, you will see that's not very trivial. I think in the configurator too has design choices and so on. And yes, you're right. And we can talk about this at the end of the tutorial if you're interested in it, because it's true that we can do PDOS. So the meta level and the meta meta level and so on. But let's let's be happy with one level because that's already quite beneficial. Okay. So here in more detail um, is how the whole thing works. Um, let's do a little formal definition. Given a parameterized algorithm with possible parameter settings, theta, a distribution over problem instances with uh, some domain, and a cost metric. And the cost metric does the following. It basically just maps a specific parameter setting and a specific instance to a real value performance measurement, such as a running time or an error rate or something like this, right? Good. And so then what happens is that we have our instances here, our algorithm and its configuration space there. Um, in, within the configuration task, we will select the parameter setting to be run and the instance to be tested. We will then perform that run and measure the performance. Um, we'll return the cost and iterate like this, right? And in the end, what we want to get out of it is the best configuration we call that theta half. Now, when I say the best configuration, I want to be very clear. Typically, we cannot guarantee in practical cases that it is the global optimum from the space because the space is far too vast um, and there are no good known complete search methods. That would be an exciting topic for research to find a good complete search method for, uh, for uh, searching these vast uh, configuration spaces, but currently there's nothing. Currently, it's all powerful heuristics that might give you a local optimum, might give you a global optimum, but you just don't know. And that's okay because when you're a graduate student, that's all you do it yourself. You won't know either when you've got the global optimum, right? So the only idea here is that you get a much better uh, configuration, much better possibly local optimum. However, there are theoretical guarantees, and I will talk a little bit more about them later. Okay. Um, and so now, given all of these um, ingredients down here, the formal um, problem is simply finding this R print here, right? Where let's not get scared by math, this is just the expectation. Um, over the uh, instances essentially here, right, and the argument over the parameter values. And so we, all this says is we want to find the uh, parameter configuration that in expectation gives us the best performance on these, uh, on this distribution of instances that we right? So it's important. All right, so then algorithm configuration, the full form of definition looks something like this. Um, an instance of the algorithm configuration problem is a five tuple um, where the first component A is a parameterized algorithm, the second theta is the parameter configuration space, um, including all the parameter dependencies, you know, hierarchical dependencies such as uh, this parameter only matters if this other parameter is set to a certain value. D is a distribution of a problem instances within a domain. Um, typically, you also have a cutoff time after which the runs of A will be terminating. They're still running. That's a very pragmatic thing because you don't want this to be crashing because there was a bad parameter configuration that you know caused an infinite loop in the worst case or just a, a very inefficient solving process. Um, and then finally, uh, you have this performance metric that measures the observed cost of running the algorithm with it on, under a certain configuration on a certain instance with that cutoff time, and that's it, right? Quite simple. And then the cost of the candidate solution, three by C of theta. Okay, so that's just the cost of the configuration, the performance of the configuration, you can say. And the goal is then to find basically the best um, configuration according to this cost. Very simple. All right, I want to briefly talk about distributions versus set of instances, right? So remember, we want to find this argument here. So a very important special case, in fact, the special case that's mostly encountered in practice is that you do not have an infinite probability distribution of instances from which you can sample. You do not have an instance generator. But in reality, what you have is a finite set of benchmark instances that somebody cares about, right? Um, and so uh, in that case, you just split the instances into a training and test set, and then you find the argument on the training set, and that's all, right? 
So the plain test strip is exactly as in machine learning in order to prevent overfitting. Okay. And then you evaluate on new instances as in machine learning. You configure our training instances, we tell you test instances to assess the generalization performance, and that gives you an unbiased estimate of generalization performance for the other uh, sequence instances. Does that make sense? So I should say a very important thing here. Um, machine learning has given us many wonderful advances. One of the most important advances is a purely conceptual thing. And it's this idea that if you optimize too much, you can overfit. And the way to recognize overfitting is to basically assess it using some validation technique, such as fallout validation or cross-validation. It turns out that that idea carries on much beyond what we call classically machine learning, you know, regression problems, classification problems, and so on. It holds quite everything where you optimize and you want the performance of what you optimize to generalize. And in some sense, all I'm talking about here, you can see as generalized machine learning. Hopefully you can see this already, right? Because if your target algorithm is essentially a classifier, then what I'm just telling you here is, you know, how to machine learn a classifier, right? Only here that I'm not saying we restrict this to classification, and because we don't restrict it to classification, of course we can't do many of the, the cool tricks and the really cool improvements that are only available if you know that you're dealing with a classification problem, right? But you can see this as a very general form of machine learning, and therefore this very general concern about uh, bias variance trade-off or overfitting um, does actually uh, uh, does show up. So there are two different instantiations that I want you to think about for a moment just to see the various flavors of, of this problem. The first is to minimize the running time of a SAT solver for a benchmark set, like, as in my steer example that I gave earlier. Um, and here, what you optimize is on a training set, this argument, as we've just seen, right? So here, the performance measure down here would just be running time, okay, of uh, a given configuration of the SAT solver on a given instance. We just basically compute the average on the training set here and then select the, um, somehow magically select uh, the parameter uh, configuration that minimizes that running time, right? And by the way, if you wonder why I always write element or why Frank always writes elements, because I forced him to do that when he was still my student and I have power over him, and apparently he then started to read it so he doesn't even know that I don't have power over him anymore, yay. And the reason why I write element here, of course, is because this uh, global minimum might not be really uniform, right? And we are happy with that. Um, so on the other hand, if I want to um, optimize the hyperparameters of a machine learning algorithm, right? Then um, we do it a little differently. Then we do cross-validation um, uh, instead of uh, optimizing on instances. And the cross-validation folds play the role of instances. And you can see now that essentially, if I have k folds, uh, capital K folds, then I'm just looking at the average performance over the folds and minimize um, the, uh, the cost for that. Does that make sense? So, as I mentioned before, doing this effectively, you get large improvements of solvers for many combinatorial problems. So, here's an incomplete list on problems <laughs> on which we've worked and actually made huge differences and won competitions and so on. SAT, MAPSAT, mixed integer programming, SAT modular theory, um, traveling salesman, um, answer set programming, timetabling, AI planning, and then we know of many other groups who've done it for a ton of other problems. So, you know. Maybe I started the tutorial wrong. Maybe I should have shown you this list without anything else on the slide and said, what if I could tell you about a magical recipe that allows you to make, just to break the state of the art on all of these problems? And you would have thought, gee, this is cooler than deep learning because deep learning can't do that. It cannot. At least they haven't demonstrated yet, right? So um, in, in reality, this really is a pretty powerful and general thing, um, as you will see from the examples that follow. And, People are recognizing this uh, recent, uh, uh, recognizing this increasingly. So this is just pulled from Google Scholar, uh, actually a few months ago. So by now, the 2016 bar will be higher because Google Scholar laps always a few months behind the tracking citation. So this is just essentially four algorithm config configurators that you can all access um, in one form or, or, or another on the web and use them for your own purposes. Paramount S, Smack. Iterated F-Race and GTA. Um, 
developed by different groups. My group has a stake in Paramount S and SMAC and a small stake in uh, Iterated F Race right now, although that's not captured there because we made our contribution there just earlier this year. Um, and basically, just the, the important papers on these algorithms and nothing else. And there's other algorithm configurators out there that are not, con uh, that are not considered here. So the rise of um, automatic configuration started in 2008 with a series of publications, um, uh, including Iterated f race and Pharma RS. And uh, what you see here is that there weren't that many citations, of course, and then it rapidly, rapidly rose. This one here in 2012, we still think is some sort of Google Scholar fluke, um, that in reality, some of these, of these here should be in 2012, and we misrecognize them. But you can see it's a nice and steady trend. trend um, that's, and these are just classic papers, right? So if you take newer papers, you see a much accelerated um, uh, uh, development here. Okay, so I now want to talk a little bit about methods, the components of algorithm configuration, right? So um, there are basically a few things that any algorithm configurator has to do, and I want to talk about what they are and then later how to do them. So first of all, there are two key components. The first determines which configuration to evaluate next, right? Because it's an iterative process where we look at one configuration at a time, or maybe a batch at a time, and there's always a question, what configuration should I look at, right? So it's from a large combinatorial space, for instance, CPLEX 76 parameters, 10 to the almost 50 configurations, right? So this is really huge. The second uh, component is how to evaluate that configuration. And you might think, well, that's trivial, you just run the algorithm and that's it, right? But it turns out that if you do that, um, you don't do too, too well. Um, because evaluating the performance of a configuration can be very extensive. And if that function is bad, that expense will be mostly wasted, right? You don't want to spend a lot of effort in determining that something is bad. You want to uh, spend a lot of effort in determining that something is good, but the bad guys you want to weed out very quickly. Right? Um, so CPLEX, we typically use a budget of 10,000 seconds per instance, right? So 10,000 seconds is kind of three hours, right? That's a lot of time. And if on a bad configuration you time out after three hours a lot, that's a lot of waste of computing uh, times. The instances vary in height, uh, in height, but some take milliseconds, other take days for the default configuration of such a solver um, to solve if there is a default configuration, as in CPLEX there is. And an improvement on a few instances might not mean very much, right? So if you get better on just a few millisecond instances, that might not mean that you really have an improvement. It might just be that you configured your solver for solving, for picking low hanging fruits very efficiently, and then it's hopeless for anything else. So, component one which configuration to choose? So, let's consider a simpler problem first so called black box function optimization. There's an entire research community out there, not in Ichai, but somewhere else, that thinks about nothing other than black box function optimization. And the idea there is simply that you have a function f uh, that you can't look inside, so you have no idea um, how f works. Um, and you want to minimize it uh, over its space of arguments, right? And the only mode of interaction is that you query f at an arbitrary theta. This is not the same as algorithm configuration because we don't have a notion of problem instances here, right? It's just that every parameter configuration gives you exactly one performance value and that's it, okay? And so this is the depiction here and this is really supposed to be a black box that takes in uh, theta and then spits out the function value for theta. And you want to configure the black, you want to determine the theta, right, such that the f is minimum. Good. So that abstracts away the complexity of dealing with multiple problem instances. Um, this theta is still a structured space, it still is mixed continuous and discrete, it still can have conditional parameters, and it's still more general than the standard continuous uh, black box optimization problem. So when I just talked about the black box optimization community, they mostly restrict their attention to functions that only take real value parameters theta, right, and nothing else. And that's, in some sense, simpler than what we are trying to do here. Good. Um, we need to balance between diversification and exemplification as always when we search, right? Do we search where we already know that the picking is good, or the going is good, or do we go somewhere where we've never been before and where we might find something good or also something horrible that just wastes us time? The extremes are random search, which is maximally diversified and does absolutely no intensification, no exploitation, and hill climbing. In hill climbing, we only have exploitation, right? 
and we have no exploration whatsoever. Uh, then, of course, there are other methods, local stochastic local search methods, typically balance those two exclusions somehow. Uh, there's population-based methods, like genetic algorithms and all sorts of other things. Um, and there's model-based optimization. And I will talk quite a bit more about model-based optimization later. Okay. Um, sequential model-based optimization is one of those techniques that we find is really, really useful for uh, black box function optimization and also for general algorithm configuration, right? Um, let me explain to you what that is if you have never heard of it. Uh, and to determine whether you've heard of it, think not only of the term sequential model-based optimization, but also Bayesian optimization, because that's exactly the same thing. So if you feel you know, more encouraged to learn about Bayesian optimization, this is it. This is exactly it. Um, so what you do is you fit a probabilistic model of the function f that you want to optimize, and you use that model to control your exploration versus exploitation trade -off. That's the entire idea behind uh, the sequential model-based optimization, right? And so the idea here is that, sorry, let me go one back. If at t equals two, um, this is our real function, but we don't know this, of course, right? Um, so let me see. Then we have an observation that we made that we have made here and here. This is our new observation. So here, actually, we know exactly where the function, where the true objective is. Sorry, the, the dash is the true objective here, right? And this is our model, okay? And there's uncertainty associated with the model, as you can see in these areas here. And the uncertainty is, of course, collapsed when we make the observations because there we just know. And it's maximal um, at the furthest point um, in between, away from observations, or in between here, right? And so now you define an acquisition function, a utility function that essentially uh, tells you where to pick. And essentially what you do is you maximize um, this function here in order to determine where to sample next. And this function typically will be something like, where can I expect to get the best improvement under optimistic assumptions, right? If within all this uncertainty I'm lucky, where could I get most lucky? And this acquisition function might reflect that maybe with a little bit of, uh, of, uh, uh, of exploitation uh, put in. So at T3 now, I sample here, and I update my model. Right, so it now looks a little different, and of course my uncertainties look very different. And now, for instance, I know that within here I don't have a sample anymore, it doesn't make any sense. Within here it makes very little sense as well. Within here it makes some more sense, but certainly here it's now looking really promising if I want to maximize, right? So at T4 I will do that, and so the uncertainty collapses here as well, and then it looks maybe here it's going to be even better, right? So you can see how that process works by continuously adapting the model based on the new data. So machine learners call that Bayesian optimization. I think that's a pretty bad term because there's nothing particularly Bayesian about it. And I think we can all hear rather than Bayes locating it is not so shallow grade because once again, his name has been used for something cool, but not really all that related to his own thinking. Um, but never mind, you know, um, it, it is what it is. Um, and the most important thing is that it basically adapts this model based on the new observations and then guides this process towards better and better solutions using uncertainty estimates um, as part of the decision-making where to look next, and this is where the kind of Bayesian uh, misnomer comes from. Component two, how do I evaluate a configuration? And here I want to go back to general algorithm configuration, right, where we do have problem instances. So where we do have um, a parameterized algorithm with the parameter settings, uh, distribution of problem instances, and we talk about how the distribution can be just a set, and the cost metric, and I want to find this argument here. So the general principle I will, I will um, actually uh, use when evaluating candidate um, configurations in here, right, um, is don't waste too much time on bad configurations and evaluate good configurations more broadly. This is very much like when you want to hire somebody, right? So think about, uh, you know, you are working at the university or a company and you want to hire somebody to do a certain task. And you get a stack full of, well, a folder full of applications like this, right? And so how do you go through? I bet you make a quick class to weed out all the really crappy ones, and then you start looking at the good ones more broadly. Well, maybe if you run out of time, you make a stack and sort of throw everybody except for the really good ones, and then evaluate those more thoroughly, but it's the same thing, right? 
you spend more time on the really promising ones. You invite them for interviews and then you try to select. It's the same principle that we want to use here. So this effectively treats the problem as black box um, optimization if you use fixed instances, right? A fixed set of instances. So let's just say I'm going to look at, you know, n instances in here. I'm going to run the algorithm on that rather than on the full set or the full distribution. I'm going to evaluate it just based on this. This is kind of like giving your job candidate just a small set of tasks to do. And if they look good on this, they will have made it into the next round and they get maybe more tasks, right? And so the issue is here, how, to, how large to choose this n. If you choose it too small, then you <coughs> over choose to these test instances. And if you choose it too large, then every function evaluation is right. So then every time that it takes a lot of time to go through the process. Okay, and so um, the idea to solve this, a really cool idea for machine learning, is called RACIC. Goes back to Marilyn Moore in uh, 1994, so more than 20 years old. And the idea is to compare two algorithms or more against each other by performing one run of each configuration at a time and then discard configurations as soon as they're dominated, statistically dominated, right? Um, and so this image there uh, basically illustrates that principle um, a little bit. Here are your different learning algorithms in this case. Um, here is the error, which in this case is our performance metric and we want to minimize it, right? And so essentially we have the error, we have an estimate of the error, an estimate of uncertainty that goes with it. And as soon as essentially, you know, I'm evaluating in more and more instances, so my error estimates become more and more accurate, these intervals here, sh uh, they, they should shrink. And as soon as one can be ruled out as basically just being worse than um, the incumbent can possibly be, I'm going to throw it out. And I'm going to use a statistical test to do that. You can save time even more if you do what's called aggressive racing, which we introduced in 2007. And here what you do is you race the new configurations against the best known, um, which discards the poor new configurations quickly and has no requirement for statistical domination. Okay? So you're racing against the best known only, and that's it. And the search component then should allow you to return configurations um, that were discarded because you were unlucky, right? Because this procedure can make errors, and you don't want to make once an error and you just send away your most promising job candidate to never find somebody else good again. So there we need to be a little bit careful. Um, we can save more time in using something called adaptive capping, which we introduced in 2009. This only holds when you minimize running time, but that's still a huge um, uh, class of algorithms where you do that. And so the idea is um, you can terminate runs for poor configurations early uh, in certain cases, right? So for example, um, let's consider this one here. So is this theta um, prime better than theta? And in my example, theta has a running time of 20, and the running time for theta star we don't know yet, but it's larger, right? And so of course the idea is as soon as we've hit 20, we know that theta star cannot be better, and I can throw it out. So I don't actually have to see exactly how bad it is, right? So I can use the performance of the best that I've seen before to cap essentially all these other ones. So we can terminate the evaluation of theta prime once it's guaranteed to be worse than theta. Okay, there are some technical details and wrinkles which I don't want to go into because otherwise we would never get copy and that would be very unfortunate, so we won't do that. Let's talk a little bit about, about systems that instantiate these components, okay? So fully fledged algorithm configurators that you can actually use in order to do PDO, right? Um, so first I want to talk about continuous parameters and single instances, right? So only one common instance um, and only continuous parameters, and that's exactly what uh, people call black box function optimization, right? Um, and there, there's essentially two techniques that we have developed that have been out there for a while are super useful uh, and successful. CMAS by Nico Hansen and collaborators is used heavily in academia and industry as a paper with thousands and thousands of citations, the, the original one, uh, and it's still you know, being further developed and, and used very widely. And then there's sequential parameter optimization, which is essentially a Bayesian optimization type technique um, with some restrictions by Thomas Bartz Weilstein as well. Um, and so that can be used very nicely, but only for black box function optimization. And what we want to do is more, right? Because we have problem instances and we have 
parameters other than just numerical of the two in slide. So general algorithm configuration methods, there are also a lot, parallel S generation generic algorithm, iterated F phase, and SMAC sequential model based algorithm configuration I've already uh, mentioned earlier, and there's a distributed version of SMAC uh, that the group of Frank, um, well, Frank started working um, with us on this at UBC, and now this group at Bible is continuing that work, uh, that basically runs SMAC uh, in parallel, which is also very really nice. So, let me talk about how some of these work, just to give you um, a good idea, and how they make use of the components that I talked about earlier. And as a baseline, I want to I want you to consider something that that we like to call graduate student descent. It's not because of graduate student descent in some way that would be mean, but because what happens if you solve the optimization problem by having a graduate student do it manually, right? And so the idea here is that you start with some configuration, and then you repeat the following process. You modify a single parameter. If the performance on the given benchmark set um, decreases, then you undo the modification and you repeat until no more improvement is possible, or it's in some way good enough, or the which type of deadline has to do something like this, right? So that's what you often do when you do it manually. And you know, I've done this when I was a graduate student, and I've done it since, um, but I'm not doing it anymore. So that, of course, you can immediately see lots of problems with that, right? It gets stuck in the middle of it's not very efficient in how it does the optimization and so on and so forth, right? It doesn't use any of the nice components that we introduced earlier, so it's clearly not a good idea, although it can be automated, and if you automate it, it will do better than the graduate student typically. So here is something better. Iterated local search and parameter configurations based work that my group has done together with the group of Thomas Schützler and later also involving my colleague Kevin Bacon-Dahl at UBC. Um, the idea is, um, if you have this very um, schematic uh, idea of a solution space here, of course, in reality, it's not a nicely continuous uh, and continuous space, but it's, it's a lot nastier. We understand this, and it's high dimensional. Um, the idea is that you basically do hill climbing, uh, or in this case, actually gradient descent into a local minimum, and then you do some sort of perturbation to get you out, and then when you do, you know, from the perturbed solution, when you do new a new run of the uh, of descent, you will hopefully end up in a better local minimum down here. That's the idea. And you iterate this process. So this is like a random walk in the space of local minimum. And notice that I said earlier, um, random sampling is a really well diversified process. Random walks have similar uh, advantages. And hill climbing is a highly, highly exploitative process. And if we mix the two together, we can make greater things happen. And this is exactly one of the very successful ways of blending the two. Uh, and this performs, as I said, a biased random walk over the local optimized becomes biased if you have some sort of criterion that, uh, that determines whether you accept the perturbation or you reject it, right? Um, now, the basic ILS framework look, works as follows. You, instant, uh, you instantiate it um, by using a fixed number of runs for each evaluation. You sample the, this number of uh, instances from the given set with repetition. So let's say you decide you want to do 100 runs, right? So you sample 100 instances from your set, and if your set doesn't have 100 instances, you might want to repeat it if the algorithm, if the algorithm that you're optimizing is um, stochastic. If it's not, then you just choose n smaller, of course. Um, you use the same instances and single random number seeds for evaluating all of your configurations. And that essentially treats the problem as a black box function optimization problem, where the function value is simply the aggregate performance um, over that set of n instances, right? Typically something like an average, but it doesn't have to be the average. So how do you choose n? If, it, if you choose it too high, the configuration uh, evaluation is too expensive, so that's not good, right? Then the optimization process gets very slow and inefficient. If it's too low, then you have a noisy approximation of the true cost, right? So you still get an approximation, but it's not very accurate. And so therefore, you can expect poor generalization to previously unseen test instances. That group is not good either. And so um, here is uh, a little uh, illustration of uh, what happens. And after that, I think we're going to go into the coffee break. So this is basic IOS um, with 100 on uh, a solver called SAPS. Um, which was a SAP solver on a um, quasi-group completion um, problem, quasi-group completion with holes, very prominent uh, problem from the sort of SAP community. Um, and uh, 
what we do here is we look at a single instance only, right? And we also use the same instance for training and test just to see what happens, right? And the only difference is the random number of seeds because this is a randomized algorithm, okay? Um, so what you see here is the performance of basic ILS 100 over time as you run this basic ILS algorithm. And you can see that, um, you know, the, the run length, the number of steps this takes um, decreases and so does the uncertainty associated with it, so the variability, I should say, over the independent months, right? So we're making nice progress. So now, um, this is on the training set. Now we do it, we evaluate on the test set, and remember that it's the same instance on the test set, just different random number seeds, right? So it's very highly related, of course. But you can still see that, yes, we're making progress, but it is actually overestimating the progress quite a bit, right? So yes, it works, but it basically overfits the specific random number of seeds that we use there. Um, and so when we now use only one run, right, rather than 100, then of course we get very, very noisy performance estimates. You can see that the process still works fine on the training instance, but on testing, it's horrendous, right? It's really bad. So that's what I, what I was talking about when I was saying that you know, if n is too low, then this will not work very well at all. You have to be very careful. Um, and so here is basic ILS 100 compared to basic ILS 10 compared to basic ILS 1. And you can see that, you know, 100 takes a long time before it starts gaining traction. Um, and here, of course, 10, it's, it's quicker. It doesn't go quite as low. And then 1, it's even quicker, but it actually uh, it gets worse again. And so this is, and this is test performance, right? This is because we've overfit, right? Uh, this is because we've overfit a little bit that we don't quite get down there. So that's the kind of trade-off we need to look at. And in order to avoid having to make this trade-off manually, um, we use the focus ILS algorithm, which I will talk about after the coffee break. So coffee break, I think, takes uh, is until 10.30, and it would be good to all uh, reconvene here at uh, 10.30 in order to learn more about focus hours and a lot of things and basic hours. All right, thanks a lot. See you soon.